going on guys? Hunter here with AM Electronics. Today we're going to be going over the X-Series wideband gauge. It's the most important gauge to have on your car when tuning. A lot of other ways that you can figure out if your car is running lean or rich, but a wideband AFR gauge is going to tell you exactly how lean or exactly how rich you're actually running so you can get the most out of your engine. Just want to put it out there that AEM was the first company to have a wideband AFR gauge. Often imitated, never duplicated, we were the first, we're still the best and the fastest. Before we jump into the kit contents, let's take a look back at our classic digital wideband gauge. The 4110 is a fantastic gauge, but the X-Series gauge just takes everything one step further. First and foremost is the LEDs. The LEDs on the X-Series gauge are 87% larger. So everything's gonna be much clearer, much bigger, in your face so you can know exactly what's going on. On top of that, the overall size of the display is 33% larger, once again, so you can see the data no matter what the conditions. Another feature that they both retain is the auto dimming feature. There's a small photo sensor at the center of the gauge that detects light that'll dim the gauge based on conditions. So no matter if it's in the middle of the day or at night, the gauge is gonna be properly illuminated. Another feature that the X-Series gauge brings in is ability to change the modes right from the front display. Previously, on the 4110 gauge, you would have needed to remove the gauge and twist a dial at the back to view the AFR and Lambda. On the X-Series gauge, you can do it all from the mode button. You can change between Lambda, AFR, and O2 percentage. Another feature that the X-Series gauge brings in is the ability to switch between a three or four digit display, depending on the precision you need. You can have one or two decimal places, depending on your use case. I also want to point out, this faceplate here is reversible. On the opposite side, It'll show you your lambda values. So depending on what mode you're on, you can have the faceplate showing exactly what you need. Also, if you want to customize the gauge, we have an accessory kit available that'll give you a white faceplate and a silver bezel. Although these two gauges both retain the same 52 millimeter mounting dimensions, the X-Series gauge is much thinner, which allows you to mount it pretty much anywhere. The X-Series gauge also has outputs for a zero to five volt serial, and AEM net CAN bus, and we'll be testing that later today. One of the top features of the X-Series wideband gauge is its response time. In a field of 17 competitors, it was tested to be the fastest responding in about 20 milliseconds. Stay tuned, at the end of this video, we're gonna jump on the dyno with Sam, and he's gonna show you what that means for tuning and how you could use that response to get a better tune or save your engine in the case of a lean spike. So when you open up the box, you have the gauge sitting pretty there, looking right at you. Can pop up the sides, we can get down into the kit and what's included. In the box, you'll get your power harness, you'll get a sensor harness, we have the sensor itself, the install kit, instructions, and everyone's favorite part, the sticker. Good for about five horsepower on the butt dyno. Another improvement we've made is to the connectors on the power and sensor harnesses. We've upgraded to this Molex connector so they'll lock into the gauge and stay in place. The power harness here, Features your power wire, 12 volts, chassis ground, serial data output, your analog zero to five volt output, and your AEM net CAN bus output. You have the sensor harness, pretty straightforward. It's 96 inches long, eight feet, plenty of length to get from your gauge pod down to your exhaust. One side goes in the gauge, the next goes into the wideband sensor. Every wideband gauge comes with a 4.9 LSU Bosch sensor. And you also have your bung and install kit with some wiring connectors and a rubber band to keep the gauge in place. One thing too that we want to mention with the mounting of the gauge, we have a plastic reinforced bracket back here. This will take the tension of these thumb screws, keep your gauge in place. So you can put it on there in its gauge pod, tighten the screws down, and it's not going anywhere. I know many of you may not have a full standalone engine management system and you're having your car tuned on an open source platform. Previously, many of those open source platforms took in data via serial, which is capped at around 10 hertz. For the X-Series wideband and to capitalize on its response time, we've added a new part number, the 30-0334. This integrates via OBD2 for 2008 and newer vehicles. You can get the AFR data to your HP tuners or EFI Live software all with a simple OBD2 pass-through connection. We also offer all of this technology in an inline controller. Part number 30-0310 
our inline wideband controller gives you the X-Series technology, the response, the 0 to 5 volt output, and the AM net CAN bus output, all from a small inline package. This allows you a ton of mounting flexibility and is perfect for the user that wants the data logging ability of the AFR gauge without the display itself. The inline wideband also gives you the ability to daisy chain up to 16 of the units together for individual cylinder trims in naturally aspirated applications. You'll have 16 unique CAN messages so you can data log each individual cylinder independently and transmit that data over a simple two-wire connection. We just completed the install of the X-Series gauge and the classic digital wideband gauge in the VW so we can have a side-by-side -side comparison on the dyno. Before we get into the tips and tricks on the sensor, Kirk has a PSA here he'd like to share. A lot of these videos, I feel like I've always got some bad news to bring. In one of our videos recently, we talked about our fuel pumps being counterfeited. We, we displayed the performance variance between our product and a, and a counterfeit product. The popularity of our wideband gauges have not gone unnoticed by the counterfeiters as well. So, the bad news is, our gauges have been counterfeited. The good news is there's ways to avoid this. One of the simplest ways is to visit our dealer locator, aemelectronics.com, click on find a dealer, and there's been some updates there. I keep on talking about cross-referencing an auction site or a website or where you decided to make your purchase to our dealer locator. The easy thing now is you can actually sort by name. So it used to be you had to sort by location or zip code. Now you can just enter the auction seller's name or the website name and the company name and they should pop up in our dealer locator. If they're not there, buyer beware. We can't guarantee it's legit product. So if you see low prices and they seem too good to be true, but it looks legit, please cross check. So you'll see the packaging I could bring up, they'll, they'll use older packaging. That's one of, the easy, one of the easy identifiers. So if you get one of our old legacy packages, be concerned. They've even knocked off our contemporary packaging. Again, this whole table is filled with samples of purchases made over just the past couple of weeks, which is disgusting. But like I said, the good way out of this is to cross check with our dealer locator. So please go to amelectronics.com, cross check the seller, make sure you're buying legit AEM product. Now I'm gonna pass it back to Hunter. Thanks. We're about to install the Bosch sensor into the exhaust for our wideband gauges. Both gauges utilize a Bosch 4.9 wideband sensor, and there's a couple considerations you want to take into account when installing the gauge and in normal use to make sure your sensor lasts long. The first of those is when starting up the vehicle. The X-Series gauge will give you a heat indicator, and a lot of people will wait for that heat indicator before they start the car. What you want to do is start the car as soon as the gauge has power. That allows the sensor and the engine to come up to temp at the same time, so there's not a temperature differential. Thermal shock is one of the things that can damage the sensors, and a hot sensor being shocked by cold exhaust gases on first startup can damage the sensor. Over time, the small sensing element inside the sensor will crack and break, and the gauge will not work properly. While talking about thermal shock, Another thing that can damage the sensor is a physical shock. Simply dropping the sensor before the install will damage the sensor and cause your gauge not to work. Another item that can cause the sensor to be damaged is high EGTs. We recommend mounting the sensor about 12 to 36 inches downstream from the exhaust exit. Now that's from the hot side of the turbo or from the head of the engine in a naturally aspirated setup. That allows the sensor to not get too hot or too cold. As I mentioned previously, it's made for a specific environment. Excess EGTs can cause the sensor to be damaged. Another item that's very typical is to not have the wideband sensor harness tied up nicely. Use the zip ties, don't have the sensor harness dragging on the ground. When the sensor harness drags on the ground, that can not only damage the sensor, but that could damage the gauge itself in the vehicle, and if that happens, both items will need to be replaced. A common killer that we see all the time is a sensor left in the exhaust, not connected to the gauge, or to a gauge that's not powered up. When the sensor is not connected to its heater circuit in the gauge, the sensor can get fouled and will cease to function. When you're installing the sensor in the exhaust, make sure the gauge is already powered up and working, and if at any point you remove the gauge from the vehicle or the gauge is not powered up, take out the sensor as well so that component does not get damaged. Another item to consider when mounting your sensor is the actual mounting angle of the sensor. Condensation is a killer and will damage sensors. For this reason, Bosch recommends mounting it above 10 degrees. So anywhere above 10 degrees will be perfect. Mounting the sensor at less than 10 degrees will allow the condensation to collect in the tip of the sensor and eventually cause failure. 
When installing the sensor, all of these come with a dab of anti-seize already on the threads for you. This allows you to install the sensor, then eventually when it needs to be replaced over time, you'll be able to remove the sensor without damaging any other components. If the sensor you're installing doesn't have anti-seize on it already, you may want to put a little extra dab on there, but don't add too much. Extra anti-seize can squeeze past the threads, then eventually contaminate the tip of the sensor, and your sensor will no longer work. For those of you guys at the track, dialing in your two-step and anti-lag and trying to make extra boost on the line, you need to take into consideration that the wideband sensor can be damaged by thermal shock. Those two-step and anti-lag events in the exhaust are explosions leading to high EGTs for a moment and can damage the sensor. One of the things that you can do to make your sensor last a bit longer is to use one of our tall bungs. These tall sensor bungs move the sensing element further away from those hot EGTs but still keep it close enough in range to get a great AFR reading. We can compare the two right now. Here we have our tall bung installed on a normal 4.9 wideband sensor. And here we have our standard bung. The standard bung is great for when you have the sensor mounted 12 to 36 inches downstream from the exhaust exit. If the sensor is mounted closer than 18 to 36, you'll want to use our tall bung. This allows the tip of the sensor to be recessed in the tall bung. The high EGTs have less of an influence on the sensing element and it'll lead to a longer sensor life. A lot of guys will also use this tall bung when they have the sensors installed in the individual cylinder primaries so that they can get a cylinder by cylinder AFR reading. Another benefit to the stainless tall bung is for racers using leaded fuel. It pulls the sensing element out of the exhaust, preventing lead contamination on the sensing tip itself, leading to longer sensor life. Now if you notice, this sensor right here completely fouled tip. It was run in an extremely rich environment for a long time eventually to the point of sensor failure. Running excessively rich mixtures can cause the sensor to fail, which is why you have an AFR wideband gauge in the first place. It allows your tuner to dial out those excessive rich or lean spots in your calibration, and when your AFRs are on target, your sensor will last much longer. As you go to install the sensor underneath the vehicle, you wanna make sure you have the proper tool for the job. The right tool is the proper O2 sensor socket sized in 22 millimeter or 7 eighths. Great part about these sockets is they have a pass through for the harness, so you can slip it right over onto the sensor and apply the right amount of torque without damaging the body of the sensor or messing with the harness. If you don't have the proper O2 sensor socket, the next best thing is a 7 eighths or 22 millimeter wrench. Simple, effective, gets the job done. What I don't want to see anybody using are any sort of adjustable wrenches that could cause you to either strip the sensor, damaging the body or the threads, or anything like that. So your channel locks, your vice grips, your giant needle nose, they all have your place in the toolbox, but they're not for installing your wideband sensor. They can damage the sensor, you can slip and hurt the wiring or the body of the sensor itself. We've seen sensors come in damaged, threads are all marred up, and the body's just about twisted off. That's because the wrong tool was used for the install. Unplugging the sensor here, gonna run it over here, turn it off, broke torque on it, so then I can unscrew it the rest of the way. So we'll take our good sensor and start threading it in, making sure it's not cross-threaded, get it uh, just snugged up. Then using our fancy tool, our O2 sensor socket, we're able to get it on there. This doesn't take too much force, but just enough. Make sure it's tight, and that should be good. Then we'll get a couple of zip ties and wrap this harness up. One thing when you guys are installing these that you wanna be sure of, this extra harness that you have here, Make sure it's zip tied up and out of the way. Big problem we see is harnesses end up dragging on the ground. This not only could damage the sensor, but also could take out the gauge itself. So extra zip ties secured up out of the way, away from the hot exhaust will be key. All right, we're all installed. Let's get Sam and get this thing on the dyno. Hey everyone, Sam with AM Electronics here. Today we're on the dyno with our test vehicle and we're gonna be doing some testing on the X-Series wideband and show you guys how fast that response time is compared to our older classic series wideband, which is also a really great gauge. I personally own one. I bought one probably a good decade ago and it's still going. But the X-Series is a great option for some of you guys that want that, that new cutting edge fastest response wideband and we're going to show you that right now. So on this vehicle we have our X-Series wideband as well as our classic digital wideband 
And just a little note, that classic digital wide band is actually being powered by our new PDU-8 that's being controlled by the Infinity system. So let's go ahead and get this vehicle started. Um, what we're gonna do is do a run on the dyno. Halfway through, I have this switch set up as a rolling anti-lag, and we're gonna force a misfire, which should show up as a lean spike on the wideband. And then we'll look at the data and see what the response time difference is between the X-Series and the Classic. Both of these wideband gauges have multiple options for getting your AFR data to your aftermarket standalone ECU or data logging system. The X-Series, we are using the CAN output wired to our ECU to bring in the AFR data over CAN. And with the Classic Digital, we are bringing in the AFR data over 0 to 5 volt analog wired to the ECU. Let's go. All right, so now that we've got that dyno run done, let's go over the data in AM data to see what that response time looks like on the X-Series versus our classic digital. So here we have the pass highlighted, and you can see this pink line is my throttle, and in this point, you can see I lifted off throttle and got back on the throttle, and going over the wideband data here, our yellow traces are X-Series, our white traces are classic digital, and here you can clearly see the response difference between the X-Series wideband and the, our classic digital wideband, just peak to peak here on that throttle lift event. On that misfire, the X-Series catches that lean miss on that second misfire caused by the rolling launch switch, and the classic didn't even see it. All right guys, so there you have it, and as you can see, the data doesn't lie, um, and as great as the classic digital wideband is um, the X-Series just gives you that little bit of edge with that response time. What that gives you is data that you can use to dial in your transients, catch any misfires that happens. Um, if you're using kind of lean protection, that just happens a little bit sooner with that response. If you guys like what you saw, make sure to subscribe, like, and hit that bell for notifications so you know when we drop the next video. Thanks for watching. Peace.